expected. The, the hidden picks already coming out. So let's see what they do with the double mages, though, because uh, this is going to be very important how their bottom lane does do. If Kramer isn't a factor, then it will become much more difficult. And going to Freak's point earlier about what changed this year, bringing in Keen and Licorice coming in, remember that the coaching staff of Afrika changed this year as well. Quintessential fifth place team. Comet joins Zephyr, the drafting coach of the Korean national team. They both join and the results go way up. And that is also something that needs to be remembered and it's being reflected in this first best of five draft. Well, Victor up in the top lane versus Aatrox. I love pocket pick counter picks. <laughs> See, Licorice thought he could bring up Hecarim and say, I can beat Aatrox as champion. Victor is the bring up here for Keen, running Klepto, as you would imagine, in a Rangers Melee matchup. This is going to be exciting. I see the big advantage for Victor as I'm going through this matchup in my head. Once, especially, you get the speed boost off of your Q. But you're not going to start out with that. Uh, so maybe in the early game, we will have jungler attention up there. We'll see how Cloud9 can actually deal with this wild card, because you need to be ready for things like this in this best of five. Well, here we are on to Summoner's Rift. The last hope of South Korea versus the only hope of North America. As a freak of freaks for the last remaining South Korean team here at the World Championship. And Cloud9 represent five of six quarterfinal berths for NA since 2012. And let's see what can come through here as we get ourselves back onto Summoner's Rift for the first match of the day. 30 seconds until some insane innovation here, especially on the Afrika side. Like you mentioned, Klepto trades with the Q auto. Going to be the big thing for Keen. Usually when you take Cassidy and you drop Wavefield, you kind of sack that as something you have. But Victor Zaya, if they are grouped, can actually be fantastic Wavefield in and of themselves. Also, in the early game here, LeBlanc can definitely harass Cassidy. Cassidy gains so much more power as the matchup goes on and closer to that level six. So we'll see about the early game here because uh, it is double AP solo laners with an AP jungler. That's one of the things I was cautioning against here with Kramer needing to find success. Uh, otherwise, these solo lanes of Cloud9 can just build early magic resist to protect them from both their laning opponent as well as the enemy jungler. Uh, but I think Afrika definitely ready for that. They've got that as part of the planning. Starting bottom side here for Spirit on the Gragas might actually uh, go top side to protect this victor early, which we kind of expected was the only opening that Cloud9 might try and take. And to me, that's that cautionary tale of we can think of, okay, you get the speed boost, the Q trades, the Kleptomancy sounds perfect. Very, very gankable top lane champion, and Xin Zhao has that targeted ability to close the distance. No Ghost Power down, but a late ward goes down by King. And you saw Licorice at the start of the game did not leash. He instead made the wave push. He grouped up the minions and is going to force his wave to push down. So it will be under Licorice's turret, and Keen cannot stop that from happening. I'm almost very curious as well about the build that Keen decides to go for with this Victor. Uh, you can go semi-tank with Victor very easily. Um, you know, getting a shield from Seraphs, or uh, some people even going as far as Frozen Heart. Um, but we'll have to see how it does develop. If he wants to be a full AP threat or maybe a midline mage there and tow the line. And I'm sure you remember, Kobe, because in, in the NA solo queue, there was, of course, the first fleet footwork mm -hmm. and Iceborne Gauntlet rush on Victor that was popular for a bit earlier in the year, late last year. It's mid lane. The flash in the mid lane going for Kuro right away. He can't get away from the chain. Ignite is on. And first blood for Jensen under three minutes. The early game. That's why we caution here for Cloud9. They attack the Kassadin pre-level six. Flash is blown from Kuro. He does have teleport. So after this death, he can teleport back out. But Sven Skarin might decide to camp that. If I was him, I'd just return to the mid lane. Uh, Spirit right now has opted to go topside instead, and the junglers are going to converge. And they found the first knockup, so Keen has to outplay this one. However, there's a jungler right there. Spirit shows up. TP burning as well. They've traded on a licorice already in the top lane. And it's now Sven forced whenever Kuro did not need to finish that TP. He has no lane to farm. Who actually comes to, I assume, finish off the kill if there was any actual attempt by Xin Zhao. There isn't. He walks down to the melee. Not a lot lost there. Nice counter gank from Spirit. Pretty brazen attempt there from Sven Skarin to go immediately from a mid lane gank into a top lane gank. And a great punishment from a freaking now on the bottom side going for a bit of trade. This keeps happening. This stun goes off on Alistair. Two send down to about 300 HP. And that is a pretty heavy trade. C9 comes out ahead. So the top lane now for a freak of freaks looking very good. Keen even got a fort pot from his Kleptomancy, which gives him much more AP. Uh, 
HP as well as some AD to try and lane with and harass. Spirit now, though, is on the warpath. The junglers will not stop. This is a very aggressive game. He's gonna be right behind the nice flash pulverize forward. Ignite is on. They're gonna keep Sneaky alive for a bit. Nice flash for the body slam. Beautiful play for Spirit, and the kill goes to Tucson. This game is dead even in gold right now. Both junglers firing away over and over. Now Sven Skarin reveals himself on a ward as he was trying to go back to mid lane, but this is big for bottom. And one of the big reasons you don't expect Spirit to be playing like this is Cezor wants to freeze up the minions as much as possible. Is he still doesn't have a keystone, he hasn't bought. Usually we see four cams into backing, buying boots and having your Predator online. That's two successful ganks. One a counter gank, one a proactive gank with no buy. Ooh, they might be looking at Keen right here. The wave is slowly stacking up, and Sven Skaren's gonna edge through to block out the minions. The mid laner coming up as well. Yep, they know that nobody else can make it from bottom lane in time, so he's showing early here. Keen does have flash. Let's see if he can outplay. He's gonna outplay the one versus three as Jensen shows up with a little bit of mana here, and the jump is forward. Licker's gonna pull aggro and Sven to deal the damage, and the pull back in. Licker's gonna drop aggro, a quick kill on the top side. Now Sven Skaren's on the board, two to two. Sat Cloud9 now overloaded three members on the top side of the map as Afrika are trying to reset. They push out bottom side as well, and this should be the first break in the game that we get. 0.4 champion kills per minute. That means on both sides for the Afrika Freaks before this, we already have four kills in five minutes. This is very much both teams adapting to expectations, I think, that were differing on both sides. Will this last the entire best of five? That's a little bit harder to see, but for game number one, action everywhere. Viewers at home that have been watching the 2018 Worlds, will be accustomed to a fairly quick pace increasing over the course of this tournament. And this one, no different. Now, we are getting to the point where Cassid in here, mid lane, Koro, is getting to his level six and will be able to actually have some agency. He is down uh, severely in CS because of the teleport that he used topside to try and protect Keen, uh, but that will change over the course of this game. Keen has been able to pick up his first evolution on that hex score. Remember, got cheaper in patches recently. They have 100 gold down early. You want to know about top lane victor and have some fun in solo queue. Here are the runes. Time Warp Tonic and Biscuiteer to get through any sort of trades in lane. And he does go for the Mana Flow Band. So basically those Q Auto trades are definitely giving him a whole lot of reward. And of course he did max Q and evolve Q first. So it is very much about the shield and single target damage, less so the wave clear. Exactly what we were thinking with the speed boost. Speed so important in any Aatrox matchup to allow you to try and dodge those Q sweet spots. And remember, you can actually get the Q movement speed whether you use it on a champion or onto a minion, and you can use it twice in an escape potentially. So a lot of ability there to kite, but doesn't mean necessarily it's gonna be any less susceptible to ganks when it flashes down. Yeah, the shield does also build up and scale with mana. So you mentioned the mana flow ban. You can also build into some more mana later, but currently Cloud9 on the bottom half of the map, now turning their eyes towards this blue buff. It'll be a smite fight. It's gonna be a collapse as well, a potential 4v4 as the move goes back and forth. One level lead. No, it's gonna be picked up right away by Sven Scaring now back over the wall. This could be a bit of a fight, a stun towards the Alistair. Will they engage on a Tucson as the blade color is down? They're gonna jump right and forward, and the damage is gonna be there. Spirit's gonna drop a one for zero, and the chase continues. Kuro over the wall. Will they chase? That answer is no, but a Grob is gonna be picked up as well. Now we watch the top side as Licorice battles for the first time 1v1 against Keen. And look at the damage coming through. The Q is on for cooldown, and so Keen can re-engage without those uh, blades hitting him again. Both of these top laners saving their ultimates, though. They know that everyone else was revealed on the bottom side of the map, so it's a pure 1v1, neither of them committing too hard. And if there is a flash all in from this Aatrox on one of those Qs, not a lot of base stats behind the Victor. So a lot of mind games around the flash usage between the Aatrox and the Victor. So we once again settle down for a little bit. An 1100 gold lead for Cloud9, including a steal on the blue buff. We can watch this 4v4 in the jungle again. All right, here's the invade. They get the blue buff. Then, after they get the stun on Tatusin, he's down to 50% HP. C9 makes the call to charge in on the three members that are separated from Kramer. No damage comes out of Zaya on that because he's across the wall. I feel like that's the sort of skirmish where if level sixes were up, it is a Freak of Freaks favorite, but Alistair can't occupy spaces bot lane. Low under Kramer has the ult, he's gonna dodge away for a little bit, but a jump forward's gonna mean the first time the knockup and another kill. Four to two, Cloud9. Lightning quick pace in this game. 
Ben Scarin has been a monster. Gank after gank after gank in Cloud9 running the early game now. The degree of difficulty of disengaging a gank when it's so much targeted CC and auto attacks with a Braum means basically the first CC skill lands, someone dies. Oh, keep your eyes open though, folks, because Spirit on the Grog has just went He's for not six! Dusan's really low, this could be a dive and a kill, and he's got him! Sneaky, a solo kill under the turret! Sneaky Lucian is able to get the 1v1 on the level five support. I don't know if Dusan's cooldown on Flash was about to come up, that looked very close. They're gonna look at the mid lane now again. Kuro has Flash this time, gets away from it. Ignite is there, they land the chain. One more auto, that should be it with Ignite. And he takes him down, solo kills all over the place for Cloud9. Big moments for Cloud9. This is feeling more and more like a Freak of Freaks in the first three games before they got things together. This is not the slow pace they used to. And in trying to catch up and keep tempo with Cloud9, they're dying left, right, and center. A Freak of Freaks come out with the planning and the lane swap here for a victor coming to the top side into the Aatrox matchup. But Cloud9 come out with pure brutality, gank after gank after gank, and they are finding the kills. And this is the time they need to prosper because scaling-wise, a lot to like about a Freak of Freaks the game goes on. Specifically, the Lucian, the LeBlanc, so strong early to mid game. Don't necessarily fall away, but you would say a Freak of favored with the Cassidy in the late game, yet, at this point, it's the better part of a 3,000 gold lead for C9. And in addition, the Cassidy being held to 50 CS at 10 minutes here. That is absolute denial from the mid lane, Jensen, because indeed there was also a mid lane gank at level two. There was also Kuro then afterwards using his teleport to the top lane. But if you give Jensen an opening like that, over and over, we have seen this player, even on the world stage, absolutely demolish opponents. And his stats certainly back it up. Second round, Robin, those 3 0 into 3 1 scoreline for Cloud9 on the day. His CSD goes up the better part of 16. Gonna go up way more with this game, including that sample size. Cloud9, they're not done. They're looking around two under the turret right here. They got a slow one to Kramer. Kramer does still have his summoners. A big stun on the front line, trying to back forward into the dive. They go, but Kramer stays alive, and here comes the teleports as the reinforcements have arrived. And Freak and Freak's gonna push. C9 right back out of that one. See if they get a full retreat here. They have been able to do it. Cloud9 also setting up another counter. Well, they're gonna find a slow bit on the spear, but watch out for the rest of this one. It's still four strong, and Afrika could turn the corner. However, it's C9 keeping them stuck inside this turret area. Yeah, look at the harassment. Chunks in the health bar on Afrika Freak side, but no answer. All Cloud9 members still healthy, and that will allow them the objective. They're playing bottom side, controlling that area, and the Cassidy is not battle ready yet, with basically no items. He's only got the catalyst and a bit of magic resist. So given that, at the top of the map, we were seeing Keen finally out trade Licorice and keep him a bit more accountable under lane. But definitely bot side, the Drake is free and the turret dies. They will be repeated again and again by Cloud9. And honestly, it should just be the turret take right now for Cloud9. They have got so much pressure on bottom side that Afrika Freaks have already swapped their dual lane up to the top side. Licorice, though, could be punished if he goes aggressive now. Pop his ult to not get one shot. And in fact, he will get the ulti turned off. And He'll revive with about 400, 500 health right there. And staying alive, nice getting away by Jensen there as Body Slam Flash came through, but did not land the target. That's a great explosive cast, though. Jensen needs the cooldowns back, does get over the wall, stays alive through a flash and an ultimate. And Jensen holds on to his own flash. Spirit using everything he has in his arsenal there, and yet unable to get any meaningful cooldowns. Top side of Freak of Freaks will answer with a turret of their own, trying to get some gold back for themselves. Gonna wave this one as far as possible. Braum is walking up, but Lucian was still, of course, in the bot lane. So, the, yes, as you mentioned, Kobe, given the scenario with ultimates down on Tucson and Kramer. No local gold. I think they were afraid of Lucian being there as well. Yeah. So half the value of that turret just disappeared. 250 only for that turret kill. Yep, you have to stay within range of the turret going down. At least one member of the team or the gold just goes into the ground. All right, let's check in with Keen's item build. He has two evolves onto the Hex score. The Sheen might signal the Ice One Gold that we were alluding to earlier. I don't think Trinity Force Victor is coming out of this game, so <laughs> given that- could be good too. Lich could be good too, you're right. Yeah, we'll see what comes through into that one. Either way, though, he's certainly going for the 1v1 focus build. That makes sense for Keen here. He's going to try to kite around through Licorice as he's jumping back four, but Licorice has a long way to go to get back to his base, and Keen is fast. Forcing the flash over the wall, Licorice having to run away. Yeah, good use of the speed boost here on display from Keen. 
constant harassment with the Sheen Fox over and over. That's what they were thinking with this entire setup of Champion Select. But will it be enough to get them back into this game? It's definitely a tables a turn moment for Licorice because he's usually on the side of the matchup that he knows better. Hecarim into Aatrox is always going to favor the Hecarim player. When you go for this off meta pick, when you innovate, you always have an experience advantage. So nice to see, even though it hasn't really translated into too much for Keen just yet. Well, either way, I do really appreciate the mid-game plays of Afrika Freaks. They were losing in so many of their lanes, especially that bot lane two on two, and they've managed to make turret trade after turret trade, top for bot, now bot for top as well. The question is, though, if mid lane tier two gets taken down, then they've maybe bitten off more than they can chew. Another trade on the mid side, forcing a flash away. <laughs> Otherwise, it was an equal trade of turrets. Jensen has full run of this lane. Kuro has nowhere safe to go. Sneaky taking wow. down another turret on top side for Cloud9. And the territory for a Freak of Freak continues to shrink. And it also doesn't really play into what we were expecting. The Kassadin last pick, because Kassadin's seen as a containment matchup where you go decent against the ball. You're not going to win, but your trades are usually pretty good with Q. Has gone way off script. It's an insane lead. 62 CS at 14 minutes. And countdown to one largest CSD at 15 of Worlds this year. This has been the most lopsided midly matchup in farm. And meanwhile, Kramer having run away, has a blast on this over that one, but he brings Sinjao with him. The dive forward, the knockup onto the both of them. That's gonna be one kill picked up and the stun under the turret. Tushin will get away. We have seen some quick games here at Worlds, but Cloud9 are absolutely making a good case for themselves in game number one of this quarterfinal matchup. Zazel and Sneaky will be able to get out. Rift Herald has been used. They want to get the last outer turret. There's no reason to give Afrika Freaks any lifelines. You want to keep pushing. You want to keep pressuring. Ensure this game ends before Kassadin has 200 CS, before Afrika Freaks as a team has 40,000 gold. They're at 22,000 now. And the one item, two item power spikes are all favored to C9. Things looking good for the third straight upset in the quarterfinals. Yesterday, both of the lower seeds won their matchup. C9, the lower seed here today. Afrika Freaks chose red to go for champ select antics. We see that with the victor top. And though the matchup has looked good for Keen, it's been the bot lane two on two, the jungle matchup, the mid lane matchup that have gone that have been going Cloud9's way here has looked for more ways to advantage themselves in this mid-game. Alright, we need to put ourselves in Afrika Freaks shoes and try and find a way out of this disastrous early game. First, we'll go through this replay, though, uh, and it's going to be a rough one for Kramer as uh, he's able to use his ultimate, and they do get the Blast Cone, getting some distance. But Zazel, no hesitation, flash in with Grom to finish off the kill onto the marks. All summoners are up because there's been no pressure on C9 to use them defensively and use them offensively for kills. To begin your point though, Kobe, I think what we always talk about in these defensive macro situations where you look at your team and say, okay, right now we're a bit like paper, we're definitely a bit susceptible. We like our scaling is getting as much of a defensive control ward line as possible and then trying to grow it. Right now, maybe it's too risky to take your Raptors so you put your control wards a bit more shallow, but as you find more and more space on the map, you push them up and you try not to give away Baron, which fortunately for Afrika has not spawned yet. Exactly, another bonus of this pick. Oh, here we go. That's a huge one, 3v3 in the mid lane, a lot of damage in the Zazel, traded back now into Tucson as well. And now here comes the evisceration as it's Fensker and Force run away, gets a knock, I'm still trying to kite. He's not going down just yet, they get the trade kill. It's actually Kuro going down, one for zero as Fen will not burn down. Kuro just did no damage at all to the Xinjiao. His Rod of Ages has to stack. He's nowhere on the map, and Afrika find nothing from a big investment. That's the problem with this theory. Kassadin can outscale LeBlanc if given equal income, but he has not been allowed any gold in this game. Absolutely held to scraps. And with those scraps, he cannot fight back. Blue buff now under contest. Ooh, one hit away from stunning Keen. He's not gonna hit just yet. Now in comes Jensen, but has to come right back out. That was a potential stun out of Victor. Blue buff steal still happens. Infernal Drake alive, and Svenskeren easily solos that one. And Cloud9 grow their lead to 7,000 plus two Drakes. Yeah, we have seen very clearly here, name of the game has to be defense for a Freak of Freaks if they want any hope of coming back in this opening game. But they keep trying to make a proactive defense by trying to find fights and just don't have the damage behind them to pull it off. A ward at the Gromp is the only siding ward, and Keen has no idea that his life is vacant. He had a flash, burns it there, and now he's running away, but the knockups are in, so there might not be the way out. The stun's gonna land, pulled right back, and another kill, his third, Sven Skerritt. 
An ominous vision toggle there by the observers. Well done, as it really conveys the story of how scary it is to play from the Afrika Freak side right now. Cloud9 is a war machine, and they are not on stopping. And you have to make these kind of poor swaps here for Afrika and say, Keen, you take the risky assignment. At least Kuro will get some farm topside while your life is very much in peril. It feels bad. It definitely doesn't allow Afrika any real movement on the gold numbers, which are still going to be heavily Cloud9 favored. But this game is really now at the point where Afrika are at the whims of Cloud9. And if Cloud9 make the right proactive calls, Afrika don't actually have the weaponry to contest a war. Well, it's going to take some time for Afrika to come back. Thankfully for them, of course, it is a best of five. You can drop a game and still come back. We've seen every series so far at Worlds go the full distance here in the quarterfinals. And today might be no different no matter what game one may look like. Baron coming up in 23 seconds. That is surely going to be on C9's menu here as they put the wards down in the river. Completely different story here in the best of five. Adaptation is so big. The window still definitely open, and still C9 do need to close this loop. Baron hasn't even spawned yet. They do have complete control. They should be able to set up the vision in this red quadrant and allow them uh, fairly easy use of this objective. However, you still have to take those steps, especially in a series like this. Yeah, the defensive setup will continue for Afrika. As we were talking about when it comes to vision lines, it can't even control that Raptor brush at present. Van Scaren in the most advanced brush on top side. You have to be disrespectful when Cloud9 have basically won eight out of nine early skirmishes, and there have been plenty of early skirmishes. Afrika set up, though, and even a catch to relieve pressure will be big, but every time they've attempted that, they've been repelled super well by Cloud9. The world's just continually going down. They can't see much more than just the very beginning of the outside of their base as top one is pushed in. C9 moves back into mid here, trying to push the people away, but there's a head of pulverize in. And the fight continues now on the front side in front of tier two. Bolt comes in for Keen as well. And Cloud9 going to disengage, but send a few back forward and knock down two, send one for zero. Explosive cast brings in, and that's going to be one kill picked up, a one for one so far. The revival coming out soon for Licorice, but it's already Keen dropping as C9 are up two to one in this team fight. They can walk right back away easily. Yeah, the objective doesn't go down. The turret Ooh. still stands, but Jensen's not done. He wants to shut down, oh! and he does! Takes out Kramer. Three to one in the team fight, and that turret's going to fall as well. Individual moments like that are game breakers when this game is really, really in the advantage of C9. Jensen gets the individual outplay to just put that exclamation point on another positive trade for C9. Jensen has been a player criticized for big moments in the North American LCS. But here in the world stage, we're going to get another look at this play from Cloud9. Watch the replay here as it goes through. Tucson tries once again to be proactive. The issue is that even through his ultimate, he's not tanky enough. And there's not enough, there's not two item spikes on anyone on the side of Afrika. Yeah, this is clearly Cloud9 with the giant gold advantage. Flickerick does teleport it in and finish off Keen here, then popping the revive off of the blade collar. As you know, this is not over. And there is more to this replay. Jensen yep. on the side, able to find Kramer. He knows Look that the Kramer chain. has yeah. no cooldowns left. Now the chain, that does look crazy when LeBlanc goes back to different spots on the map. But the chain goes straight from where you shot it. So uh, he knows in his heart, as soon as he shoots it, point blank range, right into the Zaya, that thing's going to land no matter where he goes. That was definitely a bend it like Jensen <laughs> moment because that was uh, very impressive. Look at the top here, following on with the Freak stat earlier. This is uh, C9 really fully rampaging through Afrika. Mental reset is not usually a word we use for game number two of a best of five, but already it has to be something to levy out of Freaka Freaks, given how dominant C9 have been. Ben Garrett going for a face check. One versus two, knocks him back, has a blast cone, gets away. And Cloud9 causing North American fans to dare to hope. This story of Cloud9 this year is absolutely amazing. This team subbing out star players in the summer split, falling to 10th place in the North American LCS, and have fought their way hurdle after hurdle, problem after problem, all the way to the quarterfinals here at Worlds. And with this improvement that we have seen at each stage, they don't look like they're going to stop anytime soon. The team that dares to dream biggest at Worlds has largely prospered. C9 looking for a couple of picks to break the base. Jensen goes a nice job getting away from Hebba Pulverize. Cool down for about eight seconds there for Tucson, but 
That won't signal an opening for Cloud9 just yet. They're just gonna push in this lane, but they are still setting up around this Baron. You know they can. You know a team's being suffocated where four members have actually switched over to the blue trinket just to spot a brush because they know they can't stick control wards even outside their base at any moment. They need as much spot vision as possible with Baron on the menu very soon. All right, looks like we may have another fight over vision. Kuro does rift walk out though before Cloud9 can close the loop. We do have a predator activation, but I don't think they want any fight. Yeah, it'll be a couple of ward kills here as Cloud9 knocks down the few that were able to be put down from the uh, sight stone there. But Blasco means it's C9 into the Baron pit, and they're going to try right now, leaving Zazel and Jensen to zone out the squad as two of them knock down Baron. It's important that Jensen already has a Banshee's Veil completion here on the LeBlanc, providing him immunity when he goes for harassment. We'll see if a Freak of Freaks can get in there. Baron, though, going to regenerate as they have to pull off with only two members starting it. When Tucson has to lose the ultimate as three, the blue triggers were used trying to spot out Baron. Now they're not going to land, but only onto the tank, a member of the team. Will they burn him down? A great cast pulls him back, but so does the W from Licorice. And another kill comes in for Cloud9, 13-3, and once again, they can turn to Baron. Double chains here, Licorice and Jensen both ensuring that Tucson will go down and now Cloud9 can return to the objective. The cost of a freaking going for these three blue trinkets, they only have one sweeper, he's dead, and thus they have no idea if C9 know where they're at. How much can a freaky be pushed away from this one? His health is getting a little bit lower, but look oh! at that explosion! Kino's already dead, he only built armor, and Baron is a formality, 14 to three, a 12,000 gold lead, and Cloud9 can look at the base now. You gotta love it when a plan comes together, even though Afrika's best hopes were at spotting that Baron HP, it didn't matter in the end, C9 were happy to see them come to them, and now with the Baron buff, they just wanna wreck the base on this first Baron buff push. Cloud9 starting to go Super Saiyan here over the course of Worlds, 25 minutes in, they've got Baron buff, and they are looking to finish the Afrika Freaks. And they're gonna look at it right now as the inhibitor is under fire. There will not be a defense. A good ult for Kramer gets away from an assassination that had happened five minutes ago, but the base is still falling. Top and hip is gone. The middle gonna lose its turret on top of this one. So C9, when do they get stopped? It's almost certainly not in this game. 26 minutes in, they're looking at the Nexus turrets already, but first, a quick reset to buy with their thousands of gold in inventory and take that one last death blow. Now, best of five is truly a marathon, but the first leg of the marathon definitely going in the favor of Cloud9, and we start to think about the adaptations and what they will be going to game number two as we watch uh, Jensen here on the LeBlanc going for pure harassment. Zazel and Licorice just keep up the chase. Even through the extra damage reduction of the Alistar ultimate, they know as long as they pull him back, they will be able to finish off the kill. Now, the problem with your metaphor is that I would want to call this a sprint, but it's more like Cloud9 was sprinting and Afrika Freaks had a medical emergency it had to pull out because this game has been decided very early in it. Hard to say what the comms are, but the moment you're seeing Jensen nuke four out of five members, of the Afrika Freaks. They had to know their chances were slim. Another Drake is added to the pile. It may not be a perfect game, but three kills and two of the turrets is all Afrika Freaks have to show from game number one. So this should be C9 closing it out here as they send their members back across the map, most of them now to the bottom lane to push in for the left bit. For so long, the state of League of Legends has been largely based around team fighting and five on five. But as we've drawn closer and closer to Worlds, with these small changes to the rules of the game, it has really favored those taking early moves in the game, those looking for individual outplays, and now Cloud9, they're looking to finish this first game. 27-30 in, bot lane being seized by Jensen, the rest of the team in the mid lane, nice look back, and they might make down Sneaky, and they will, one for zero. This should be the last stand for Afrika as they dive into the back lane, but Jensen's already picked off the Marshman down there. Kuro's got a pop of Zonia's Hourglass, Tucson is gonna drop as well, turn to the ground beef, and the chase continues with three surviving members, but there's minions inside the base, and though trade kills are coming through, the minions that six man might just be enough. Afrika trying to survive, but their base can't run away, it can't and heal, and the attacks come through, and the three surviving members of Cloud9 will take game one. Powerful opener here from the Cloud9 squad. And Afrika Freaks are left to adjust, already turning their eyes toward